numbers? Yeah. That's right. Oh, I didn't realize I didn't realize that's what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's what you have at the bank right now. That's your reserve monarch power. Um, and obviously we generate seven, seven, and four every month. So each month I can watch those go up by seven, seven, and four. And that's right. Okay. That's right. Um, let's come over here to let's go ahead and click on the country view real quick. Okay. So we have a four, four, one, and that's pretty good. But our military skill is a bit lacking, and I would probably say out of the three categories, administrative skill is probably the most important. But the second best by far is military power. You want your military power to be high so that you can get uh, military technology, which is military technology is probably the most important technology you can grab because it allows your armies to be better than other countries and you get to fuck people up. Okay. So you can set what's called a national focus. It's a focus for your country. You have a certain ambition. You want things to go a certain way. You want to, you know, focus on one specific thing. I'm going to go ahead and set our national focus to military power. I'm going to click on that. Now, how many points are we generating? 666. Six, six. That's right. So we took away one point from the other categories and put it towards military. So now we have a pretty balanced distribution of, of uh, monarch point generation. You know? So you could okay. either have a 774 or you can have a 666. And I think it's better to go for a 666. So you, you add two to your military power generation every month and you decrease it by one for the other categories. You can't change your national focus that often. You can only change it every 25 years. So we'll have to stick with this for a while. Hopefully we don't lose our damn king. <laughs> okay. I was about to ask because I just saw that little pop up and say every 25 years. And I was like, did you mean to do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So let's go ahead and unpause. And let's see what's going on with Ryzon. Ryzon is in a war right now with the Great Horde. And I think he's going to die. Or he's going to get um, vassalized. By the, by the Great Horde. Perhaps we can okay. declare a war on him. On either the Great Horde or Ryzon. If he's a vassal of the Great Horde, we'll be fighting the Great Horde as well, who's one of our rivals. Um, I think we can probably beat the Great Horde in battle. So, we'll see. So, we're moving the troops to the border. Uh, now, we don't have our military maintained at the moment. That's alright, though. Let's see what happens to Ryzon. Let's see if he becomes a vassal. So we have no clue how far along he is on that siege, though. Unless uh, we... Actually, yeah, you can actually click. Click on the province of Ryzon. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. This is so a I siege can still screen. see the siege. Yeah. Um, so the defender, the attacker. Um, you can see what happens to the enemy siege. You can see what happens to the enemy siege um, in the defender screen. Right there by the, um, right there by the sortie from siege button. Do you see that? Yeah. Go to the right. You see the water shortage? Yeah. So water shortage, obviously, is going to make it harder for the defenders to hold out. Um, there's different, you know, there's different, uh, things that can happen. Um, like a water shortage, desertion of your troops, um, disease outbreak reduces the garrison of both the attackers and the defenders. So disease outbreaks can be, like, Sons of bitches. They can really slow sieges down. Let's see. Ooh, I Jibber. just noticed from Musco uh, Muscovy just became a great power. Yeah, he just became a great power. He also formed a, um, a personal union with Tiver. So, the 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 king of Muscovy is now the king of Tiver. Okay. Interesting. So Ryzon has been fully okay. occupied. Yep. And he basically ceded everything to, uh, oh yeah, check it out. Yeah, you can actually click on your notification. You can see the peace deal. Uh, Ryzon accepted peace with their former enemies, Great Horde. Uh, Ryzon will cede Ryzon, Yelets, and Pronsk to Great Horde. Ryzon will become a tributary state. Okay, so basically Ryzon is a tributary state of the Great Horde now. So can't really do much against him. That's all right. Okay. We lost, we probably lost our border friction CB against him too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, any immediate questions right now? Not right now. Um, I think I got that whole top bar thing down pretty good, and I now know that border friction CBs are awesome. Don't know they, why, but we'll figure it out one day. They're really good. They're really good because, first, you can't really get them unless by event. 
And when you have a long land border with a country, say we border Muscovy, right? We border Muscovy with three provinces. If we had a border friction CB on Muscovy, we get to take all of the country or all of the provinces that we border. I think it's at like 50% cost. Yeah. Instead of paying 100% cost, it's 50% cost. That's, that's how you fight wars, is you can demand certain things from countries for a certain, what they call, war score cost. The more territory you occupy, the more men you kill, the more blockades you have, increases your war score. But the more they kill of your troops, occupy your provinces, your war score will decrease. Okay. So, we can't do anything over here to the Great Horde. We can't do anything to uh, rise on. Um, do you see this little country of ODF? Yeah. I think he's going to be annexed by Muscovy, so that's unfortunate. So, if you wanted to attack a country right now, who would you want to attack? We could, hmm. we could probably attack the Livonians. We could probably attack the Teutonic Order. We are allied to Poland. You got to remember that. So we get Poland and his vassals in a war as help. If 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 we wanted to, if you wanted to call him in, you know. So if we get Poland, I want to make it where Poland's more inclined to help. I'd probably go for the like the Teutonic Order then. That's right. That's right. Um. Let's see. Now, say someone like Crimea. Go ahead and come over to Crimea and go ahead and right click. Okay. Uh, it brings up his diplomacy page, right? Right. Yeah. And does he have any allies? Uh, no. So do you think it'd probably be a good idea to attack the Crimeans? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think so. They're too. isolated, right? That's right. He's diplomatically isolated. Uh, it's kind of the same thing as like, uh, well, yeah, diplomatic isolated. You know, I was gonna say something about the modern day, but <laughs> uh, so yeah, basically we could we could probably He's declare North war. Korea, right? I know, yeah, North Korea or something like that, right? The the more yeah. allies you have, the more vassals you have, you know, you're interconnected to the world around you. Um, or if you want to be like North Korea, you don't have any allies or just one quote cool ally, but that one mm -hmm. ally might have more power over you than you have of them. You don't want that. You want countries to be subservient to your will. You don't want to be dependent on some other country's fortunes. You know? I know it sounds like Machiavelli because it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, we could declare war on Crimea. The problem is that we don't have a reason to go to war. Uh, or, like, a good reason. Uh, what we could do, though, is we can fabricate claims on Crimea and generate a few claims on his territory. And once we have those claims... Ooh! Heir to the throne! So do you, we have an heir to the throne now. Instead of having no okay. heir, we have a new heir. He's the three one five. Is that a good ruler? Wait, hold on. There, okay, there he is. I had like another pop up at the same time. Oh, okay. Oh wow, we had actually two pop. We had three whole pops up pop ups at once. Mm -hmm. So okay, we got a marriage to a queen, who's a five three two. That's right. Then we got the three one five heir. That's right. Then we got the House of Kalajbajan, which is an out to everlasting friendship is our only choice. Oh yeah, that probably us. that probably explains the marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah the that, union of. Yeah, I see it. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll just click it because we're we're gonna get local unrest negative three, local missionary strength negative five. Though that's bad, and monthly autonomy change plus point one zero. Oh yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. let's take it for here. So now we can, yeah, now we can continue. Uh -huh. Okay. So, I think, yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to fabricate claims on Crimea. So let's go ahead and right click on Crimea. All right. Let's go to the tab that says covert actions. This is a diplomacy screen. You could do all sorts of actions from the screen. We'll, we'll get to them as we play. But let's go to okay. covert actions. And there's an option here that says build spy network. We're going to click on that. And okay. it's going to ask you, do you want to send a diplomat to build up our network of spies and informants in Crimea? Yes. So we want to confirm that. The shortcut for All confirm right. is C, the, the letter C on your keyboard. Just so you know, I'm not, I'm not really a shortcut person. So I like to oh, play shit, the yeah. whole thing through. 
shortcuts are super important in eu4 once you once you get more experienced you'll you'll see the value in them um clicking everything literally every button every option just gets way tiring pressing the letter c to close down dialogues close screens is it just it helps so much but you know in time in time i mean i got a thousand hours in this game and i don't i don't even know all the shortcuts yet so we're gonna build up a spite network in crimea it's gonna take some time it's gonna take some time uh, we got see. a new pope. News from the Holy See. We have a new pope. That's right. He's loyal to France. So France is the leader of the people of the people uh, Curia. Uh, it's not too bad for us because you know France is not an enemy of us. Um, preferably we would control the Curia, but you do what you can with what you have. I'm pretty sure we'll go over the pope later, right? And yeah, I mean, um, if you want to generate more influence in the Curia, you can actually make the pope like you. So say, why don't we do that? Let's go over here to Italy. Okay. Go ahead and right click on the Papal State to bring up the diplomacy screen. Oh, surrender of Maine. Oh, looks like England has declared war in France. There's a continuation of the Hundred Years' War. And so we're, we're, we have the Papal State dialogue open. Right. Go ahead and click on Relations. Okay. And then go ahead and put, uh, click on Improve Relations. Oh, wait. Okay. Oh, I think I already did it. Shit, yeah. My bad. You did it. It's all right. I didn't stop it. Um, so that'll send one of our diplomats to go into relations with the Pope. The higher the relations with the Pope, the more people influence you get. Uh, go to the bottom near your mini-map. Do you see a little okay. curia, curia sign? You can click on that. Okay. And that brings up the, the Holy See. Uh, your papal influence, you can actually see it right there. It's a little cross. Oh, we got okay, insulted yeah. by the Great Horde. Interesting. So for uh, for the people influence, the higher your relations, the more quickly you generate people influence. Uh, you can also see France is a current Curia controller. He controls the Curia. The Curia. So, um, okay. There's a couple of actions that you can ask the Pope for. If you have high people influence, usually 50 or more, maybe 100. Um, some of them are pretty good. There's that you can levy church tax. Um, I find forgiving usury is pretty strong. Um, sending a papal legate is pretty strong. Um, beatify a local saint is okay. 100 people influence one stability. That's not bad. My strongest though is probably proclaim a holy war, which gives you manpower cover speed plus 15%. Um, those those are usually the only actions I do. So we'll see if we can get some. Uh, you know. Some people influence and use one of those actions later on. Okay. So we're building up spy power in the in the uh, Crimean region, right? Where Crimea owns land. Okay. And uh, the land that he owns is a different culture than ours and a different religion. So when you take that territory, do you think it's going to be difficult to hold on to? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Basically, it is. Um, it's good. There's going to be an arrest. There's going to be rebels and stuff. And we're going to put it down by force, basically. Um, actually, do you know about the map modes? The bottom right? I know probably the more basic ones. Like religion, culture, political one. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know how to go in there and find the one that we might want to use. But that's about it. Go ahead and click on religion. Yep, got it. So you see, all this territory that we own over is not Catholic. It's actually Orthodox. Right. So obviously after the East-West Schism of 1055, there's Catholic world, Orthodox world. Later on, the Protestant Reformation will come about. So then it's Catholics versus Protestants versus Orthodox. Then the motherfucking Calvinists are going to come around. Then we got Calvinists versus Catholics versus Protestants versus Orthodox. And then like, you know, fucking Mormons come around. Not in this game, but, you know, other games. And then you got like Mormons versus Protestants versus fucking Catholics versus Orthodox. Versus uh, the Calvinists, you know, it's a bitch. Um, so you want to control territory that's your religion, your culture. Culture is not so bad. Religion can be pretty bad. Like if most of our country was, you know, most of our country is Orthodox, which means we have low what they call religious unity. Which means, you know, our people suffer religious strife, basically. Um, controlling Sunni territory is only going to make it worse. Muslims love being ruled over by Christians. 
You can also see in the religious map mode that most of the world to the east of us is all religious. So. Okay. You got an event? Yeah. Clergy condemns a philosopher as a heretic. Uh, support clergy will lose one stability. We'll get increased narrow-minded until 8th March, uh, 1458. And uh, missionary strength plus one. Technology cost plus 5%. Clergy estate gains 10 loyalty and then, uh, or we could support the philosopher and we'll lose one stability for that too. Lithuania, Lithuania will get increased in, uh, innovative until 8th of March, 1458 missionary strength, negative 1% technology costs, negative 5% and the clergy estate will lose 10 loyalty. So we can either gain missionary strength to lose technology or lose missionary strength to gain technology, which we were, you know, talking. That's right. So preferably about. you want, preferably you want your, your technology cost to be pretty low. You know, you don't want, you want to buy technology to discount. However, considering that we have a lot of territory that's not Catholic, we would want to convert that territory, right? Yeah. And so having missionary strength would be better, right? To yeah, convert, I would agree with that. To convert. The question is, though, is right now at this moment, do you think we should get a cheaper technology cost and lose missionary strength or have more missionary strength at the cost of a more expensive technology? And I think I'll since let, we're also I'll, trying I'll to get... Yeah, I think because we're trying to get the Crimea as well, which is a completely different, you know, un, you know non-compatible religion, I think it'd probably be better to have that missionary strength, right? Yeah, I would say so too. Actually, I would probably pick missionary strength in this case. Okay. Yeah, what's five percent technology cost for ten years? <laughs> you know, I mean, that could add up quite a bit, but oh yeah, right. I So now you can see we have low stability, negative yes. one. We have to go to we have to click on it. Go ahead and click on it, and with stability minus one, go ahead and boost stability. I'm clicking, but it ain't doing nothing. Oh. Oh, you're talking about the little flag. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. And boost it with uh, is that diplomatic no, or it's actually administrative. administrative. Yeah. Okay. That's why administrative is so important is because okay. it, it affects things like um, inflation and affects things like stability. So it's, it's very, very important. Also, when you conquer territory, it also affects things like, like um, coring. Uh, do you know the difference between cores and claims? I guess a claim is something that you don't have control over and a core is something that you actually own, maybe? Uh, yeah, basically. Um, a core territory is a part of, you know, a part of your country that people see as like, oh, it's always been ours. You know, it's our land. We've always been there and we live there and shit. Every time you conquer territory from countries, you do not have a core on it. You have to make it into a core which costs admin power. Um, you can leave it with as not a core, but you don't get any benefit from it, really. And it increases what, what's called overextension. So if you're conquering all this territory across the world and you don't core anything, your country is basically in, in shambles trying to govern this realm where we have no cops, no healthcare, no government, nothing. We don't tax anybody. You know, they're fucking at us with pitchforks and, you know, gorillas and shit. So every time you conquer land, you need to core land. And it can be expensive, especially when you take wealthy provinces. The wealthier a province, the more difficult it is to make it a core. And wealth you're talking about with development, right? That's right. Okay. That's right. So, All right. Um, let's continue on. So when we conquer Crimea or some Crimean territory, we're going to need some admin points to make that new land into a core. Or we maybe vassalize Crimea and just keep them as a vassal. Um, but the hordes, so that, so Crimea is a horde. He's a step nomad government, uh, which basically means, you know, he's like the Mongol, the, the successors of the Mongols. He's not used to normal government. He's not used to normal diplomacy. You know, there is no central government that he has. He doesn't have bureaucrats, you know, he's just kind of these backward horse riding nomad sons of bitches. So. You can't really vassalize hordes and stuff as easily. They're they're more disloyal. You know, they succumb to rebellions and revolts and stuff pretty easily. 
You want to get rid of the hordes. You don't want them around. Trust me. Okay. So. War of the Roses. Yeah, there's a War of the Roses over there uh, in England. So England is, is making some bad decisions on his part. Go ahead and click on the Crimean province of Mansoor. All right. Go where it says demographics. And it says cores and claims, right? Hold on. I'm looking for demographic. Okay, yeah, I got it. Right in the middle. Yeah, right in the middle. Right in the middle, yeah. And cores and claims. Do we have any claims? No. And do we have any cores? No. Now, do you see a little button to the right? It says fabricate claim. That's right. Go ahead and click it. Do you wish to fabricate a claim? I'm going to guess yes. Yep. So we All built right, up so our we... spy network. We sent our informers out there. And now we can fabricate a claim on Mansoor, which we just did. So now we have a claim to that province. And if we wanted to, we could attack Crimea for it. Okay. However, we border two other or two other provinces by land, and we border one other province by sea. And you have to border a province by land or by sea in the same sea tile to be able to claim it. So do we declare the war now, or should we get some more claims? What do you think? Uh, probably go ahead and get more claims. That's right. So we, we're, we're not going to declare the war just there. We're going to wait a little while. Do you think we can go to speed three? Let's try it. I don't... I think it may be okay. We'll see if it gets a decent. It'll let us know. Although we've actually done pretty good so far. Yeah, I think we're, I'm looking at it right now. I think we're just fine. Okay. So we're going to let our spy power build up in Crimea. And we will invade there. Once we have claimed basically Mansoor, uh, Kizil Yar, Yedishkul, and then his capital of Crimea itself. So you can claim the capital region as well? That's right. As long as you border it. Now, okay. in, in a war, it's more expensive to take the capital province than any other problems usually. Um, we might not be able to take Crimea in this war. I don't even know if we want to because it's just a shit ton of unrest. It is a wealthy province, though. It's got 18 development. Um, actually, go ahead and click on Crimea. Okay. You can see the base tax, the base production, and the base manpower of the province. Obviously, they do what they, do what they sound like they do. Base tax is your, is your tax base, how many people there are to tax. Your production is basically your merchants, your craftsmen, things like that, laborers, the people who are, you know, working in the mines and building shit for you, building swords and shields and armor and stuff. They make you money. And then manpower is basically how many men there are that want to volunteer for your army. Um, most provinces have one category that's higher than the rest. So, you know. We just happen to find one with the 666 on it. Yeah, basically. So 18 development is kind of a lot of development. Um... Let's say, let's go over to, um, go over on the map, go over to Paris. Go over to Paris? Uh -huh. Paris, France. Mm, let's find it. There it is. And how many, how much development does it have? 32. Yeah, I think, I think Paris, I'm pretty sure Paris is the highest development province I think in Europe right now. As far as I know, as far as the game starts, I believe that is uh, that is true. Yeah, I'm looking around at some other ones I would expect, and it's definitely. I think it is Paris, as far as I know. There actually is also a map mode. Go down to the bottom right. Ooh, the end of the War of the Roses. Go down to the bottom right. Okay. You have political map modes. Diplomatic map modes, economic map modes, and geographical map modes. Go over to economic. All right. And you're going to get a list of map modes, but the second one should be development. Click on it. I got it. Anything that's green is very, very, very high development. You can okay. See Western oh, Europe, wow. on average, is more development than the east. And even kind of the north. That changes over history, but... So, France... 
with Paris. Paris has 32 development. I think the only other provinces that come close is, I think, Milan at 30. Florence at 28. And Rome at 25. I got Rome at 28. Or Rome at, yeah, Rome at 28. And then Napoli is 25 as well. Okay. Pretty wealthy places. Um, Constantinople is also pretty large too. Uh, 23. Vienna's at 21. Um, Moscow's at 17. So, you know, not bad. You can see Lithuania and most of the territory in the east does not have very high development. You know, so it's it's sometimes not exactly worth attacking for that land because it's so cheap. You're not going to see any benefit, really. So. So we just let, I guess, the AI control and develop their own land until we're ready for it, then, if that's kind of the case? or Uh, yeah, you can do that. Like your your vassals, say you have a vassal, right? Mm-hmm. Usually vassals develop their own land, you know? So sometimes it's better off leaving a vassal alone for a long time, letting him develop land for you, and then you annex him later. He improves the territory for you for free, you know, rather than doing it yourself. Um, let's take a look around. By the way, we got negative 25 to our spy network. Yeah, I actually saw that. That's a shame. Uh, that's because our agent was discovered. So your spies and stuff can be discovered. Um, your spies and stuff can be discovered. Uh, and your... Your spy network will basically not grow for a couple months. I think it's three months. Um, let's actually take a look. Go to Crimea. All right. Is he at war? Yeah, with uh, Great Horde. That's right. The reason for that is, is because Crimea was guaranteeing the independence of a Theodoro and Circassia. The Great Horde declared one Circassia, Crimea was called in. So do you think right now would be a good time to declare war on Crimea? Yeah, uh, he's going to be looking the other way too. That's right. So he's basically fighting a two-front war. However... Does Crimea have allies now? Yeah, he has Kazan. That's right. And Kazan is one of the stronger hordes that are here. So, originally we were going to fight a war against just Crimea. Now we're going to fight a war against Crimea and Kazan. I think maybe we should wait. But do you think it'd be a good idea to perhaps fabricate claims instead of Crimea? Do you think we should fabricate on the Great Horde? Let me look at him. Uh... He's allied. He's allied to Uzbek, but we don't know where he's at. I guess. That's right. Uzbek's actually over there by No Guy, way in the east, way far away. Okay. So, I think what we should do instead of fabricating on Crimea right now, because our agent was discovered anyway, we're gonna go and get rid of our diplomat. And once our diplomat is back home from Crimea, why don't we start fabricating on the Great Horde? And let's okay. see how the war plays out between them and fight whoever is weaker. All right, just so you know, we did get a pop-up. Local fortification expert discovered. So we, we gain a military engineer. Fort defense goes up by 20%. Or we can let him stay home in Smolenska. Gets local fortifications until 2nd of January, 1821, which is a local defensiveness of 25%. Yeah, go ahead and let him stay home. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and wait for Dimet to come back, and we'll start fabricating on Grey Horde. All right. So uh, I'll do this one. Ooh. Uh-oh. Yeah, did you see that? No, I didn't. Oh, we can't even the Great War. Shit, okay. No, we can't. Uh, what happened? Let's actually come back from the Curia for a second. <laughs> Let's come back from the Papal State. Our diplomat's gonna come back. I'll show you. I'll show you when the, the notification pops up again. Top left. Do you see that? You can intervene in great wars between other great powers. Oh, okay. So, when there is a war going on between one great power and another, you can't intervene in any wars. However, when there's a war that's lopsided, say two great powers against one. 
you can intervene on the side of the weaker great power. So in this English-French unification war, we could intervene on the side of England, who's fighting France and the Ottomans. Does that sound like a good idea? So hold on. So he's, or we could intervene where it's England facing pretty much everybody else in the West. Yeah, France, Aragon, and the Ottomans. So we would intervene on behalf of England? That's right. If you wanted to. I don't think to, that's a good idea. But that's not a good idea, so we're not going to. So it's yeah. Like that. So you can go and just get rid of that notification. All right. We can go ahead and keep going. 